All right. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Erickson, an associate professor for the online clinical mental health program at the Chicago School. And I'm fortunate enough to work remotely from my home in Colorado. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing one of our doctoral students, Irene Gomez, for the Big Ten Questions Initiative. Irene is a licensed professional clinical counselor in the state of Maryland and works as a bilingual therapist with children ages four through 13 in a school-based setting. She recently gave birth to her first child, Luca, who is four months old. This term, I've had the privilege to work with her as a graduate assistant for residency one. And honestly, I was thrilled to meet her in person during the face-to-face -face three day intensive in Washington, DC. Welcome, Irene. Thank you so much, Dr. Erickson. <laughs> you are welcome. So for our interview today, I have pre-selected 10 questions to ask you in an effort to give others the opportunity to learn more about you and to deepen our connection. Sounds good. All right. I encourage you to sit back, relax, and hopefully have some fun as you answer the questions and share more of who you are with us today. Okay. <laughs> All right. So when you're ready, we'll get going. I'm ready. Okay. What was your first job and how did you prepare? Well, let me start again. What was your first job and how did it prepare you for your current role now? So my first job was in undergrad. Um, I went to the University of Maryland College Park, and I was an usher slash ticket sales for in the music in the music building for the music department. So my role as an usher, I would hand out like the pamphlets for the performances or scan tickets and lead people to their seats or answer any questions that I could. Um, mm -hmm. And as a ticket sales, I would either give out the tickets at um, what's it I think box call or um I can't remember what the window was called but when it was the day of the performance if a patron would have bought their ticket in advance and we had it um there waiting for them I would give it to them or I would sell tickets um and so I didn't think that any of those skills that I use there were going to be relevant into what I'm doing now but realistically the people skills like the communication skills that I learned is something that I brought into my career now. Although I don't tell clients, your seat is here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, maybe if the seat is in front of you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, but it's just those like people skills, those social skills um, is something that I use with my clients. And with since I work with kids, with the parents, um, I do know that a lot with the majority with the parents that I work with, um, mental health is very stigmatized. So I've learned how to bring it up and communicate with them and use those people skills that I used as an usher to kind of de-stigmatize mental health a little bit and get their their foot in the in the right direction and getting their kids some help. Sure. I can just see you handing out those those tickets and showing them to their seat with the smile that you have right now. Yep, you were the face for that institution. And so the job. how lucky they were. <laughs> All right, thank you. You have to wear a t-shirt with one word on it for the rest of your life. Which, would, which word would you choose to put on that t-shirt and why? A single word? A single word. you know what, I'm not going to think about this for too long. And I'm going to say the first word that comes to my mind. The word is grace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, recently, I've been using this word a lot. <laughs> um, definitely during residency, it's something that we spoke a lot about giving ourselves grace. But I think just recently in everything, not just career wise, academic wise, but also personally, it's so important to give ourselves grace in everything that we do, because at the end of the day, we are doing our best and 
that's all that we can do. Um, giving ourselves grace means we kind of are kinder to ourselves too. And I think that's a lot of times we're so stressed and overwhelmed because we want to be so perfect that we forget, we forget to give ourselves some, we forget to give ourselves grace. So I think that's the word I would, I would put on a shirt. Oh, I love what you said. Our best is the best we can do. We can learn, but we're giving our best. So grace, give yourself grace. Yeah. I can see you wearing that too. <laughs> maybe you should go make some shirts that say grace now. Yep, maybe, maybe, maybe with a little bling on it too. Yes. That would be cute. All right. What's the most common compliment people have given to you? Everyone says that I smile a lot. <laughs> um, and I do. I I feel like I'm a very optimistic person. Um, not to say that when I'm feeling other feelings, I don't smile because I definitely don't. If I'm upset, I will definitely be upset and I don't force any smiles. But a lot of a lot of times I like if you do see me, I am smiling a lot. I think that's just goes with my personality I don't know how to explain it <laughs> I like I just like smiling a lot you're doing a great job and it's naturally showing right now too uh, that that smile that you have your you welcome people into your space it's an inviting part of who you are and so it's yeah. not surprising that you get complimented on that because that's one of the first things I noticed about you when I first met you Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're welcome all right if you had a theme song that played whenever you walked in a full room of people Irene what would that theme song be Ooh. that's a hard one I I'm going my mind is going to all my favorite songs but again I'm not going to think too hard the very first song that came to my mind was is everybody by the backstreet boys <laughs> say more about that one <laughs> is everybody everybody by the backstreet boys by the back yes by the backstreet boys since i was little irene i have been obsessed with the backstreet boys and i vividly remember having little concerts of me singing everybody to my family and I whenever I hear that song I just I I go crazy I know almost all the words I've forgotten a few as the years have gone <laughs> I hear that song and I'm like I just start dancing along to it so I feel like it's a very good opener yeah yep. you were pulling a few moves even now as you said I start dancing and you started to move the song yeah. started playing in my head I couldn't help it <laughs> no it's great so that would play so when I hear that song now, I'm going to think of you entering a room. Yep. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Funny. Yep. And maybe you even had a poster of them in your room growing up. You know, I didn't because <laughs> once I was allowed to, there weren't posters of them out there. <laughs> there you go. All right. Just thought I'd check that out. I mean, thank you. Okay, here's an opportunity if you want. We allow lifelines. So if you happen to have a lifeline to your best friend right now or a close friend that's known you from childhood, um, feel free to use them as a lifeline to answer this question. I'll ask the question and then we can come back to it when your friends responded or um, if not, you can answer it, but know that you have a chance to use a lifeline right now. Okay. Okay. How might your best friend describe you? I know the answer to this. And the only okay. the answer to this is because, funny enough, I was just talking to my best friend about it because I was just curious. And so... um. My best friend, I've known him since I was six, I think it was. It was around first grade or maybe kindergarten. I don't remember. It's been, it's been a, it's long. a long time. 
It's a really long time. It's been a long time. So we've kind of lost track over 20 years of friendship. <laughs> um, and he said that the way that they, uh, he would describe me is I'm someone that likes to give without asking. So <laughs> if I see someone in need, I try to go help them as best as I can. And he, he said, ever since we were young, I don't remember this. So I can't attest to this, but I've always been like a good listener and uh, he's going to, he brings up the smile. He said, you always kind of made me feel safe and welcome. And so he said, I try to do that no matter if people are rude, because <laughs> we've been in the middle where people have been kind of rude. And I'm like, that's not nice, <laughs> but I, I, I'm just someone that's giving and kind of put people in front of myself. Like if, if there's a need, I do whatever I can to help them. And so, yeah, that's funny how that's a question when we, we were just talking about this on Saturday. <laughs> so not even a week ago. <laughs> there are no coincidences, Irene. No coincidences. All right. So generous. Yeah. He would describe you as generous and kind and welcoming when folks are speaking to you or when they encounter you. Yeah. Um, okay. Those are nice qualities. Yeah. I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you feel happy to, to exactly. To All hear, right. Just hear from someone else. Mm -hmm. Right. What are some assumptions people made about you and or your family? Mm. How did this impact you? Um, I think there's been a lot of assumptions made about me throughout my life based on how I look, how I speak. Um, so your appearance. Yeah, my appearance. Um, and... My, my my racial identity uh, mm -hmm. I identify as Latina mm -hmm. um, um and because of that there's been a lot of I don't know if I would say maybe difficulties in certain areas um because it's been assumed that you know uh I don't know what I'm doing I'm not supposed to be where I'm at um Unfortunately, throughout, like in high school, I was told I was never going to accomplish anything in my life, things like that. And so at the time hearing that so young, it did take an impact. It did take a toll on me. It impacted me a lot. And I was really hard on myself. But thankfully, I was able to kind of turn that into like a fire to prove them wrong. <laughs> Mm -hmm. what? Yeah. I, I, I'm going to show you I, <laughs> I am going to do it I'm going to accomplish what I want to accomplish and then who's going to look silly now um, but I, I'm not going to lie it did hurt and mm -hmm. it impacted me a lot but I think thankfully for me it, it I was able to turn that around instead of rather letting me sit with that and kind of keep that with me I turned that in, into like a motivator to accomplish my dreams and as an adult, I can hear it. It doesn't bother me anymore <laughs> because I'm like, I think you're having a bad day. <laughs> and I can, I can take it from that approach now. But I think if it weren't for the fact that I was able to change it to like a moving and driving force, that it probably would have impacted me more negatively for like a longer period of time. Sure. I mean, even when I first asked the question, I could see some of the pain in your expression as you went back to remember what it felt like. And um, it showed your, your whole body and your expression said, yes, that, that was painful. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been a while since I thought about that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good reminder to have too, because it just shows how far I personally have come. Where like now that I was reflecting, I'm like, as, a, as younger Irene like yeah that hurt now I don't see it the same way and I can just I can just brush it off and be like nah they're having a hard day they woke up on the wrong side of the bed I feel bad but I'm gonna keep doing what I have to do <laughs> exactly your determined nature and resilience you put that forward and look at where you are now 
just like you said, we've accomplished quite a bit. All right, if you had your own talk show, who would you invite as your first three guests and why? Oh man, okay. Um, this is hard. It is hard. Take your time. Okay. So I think I'm a, as my very first guest, I am a huge, huge U.S. woman soccer team fan. Huge <laughs> fan. <laughs> um, they've kind of inspired me as a female bodies of power that they can do whatever they want. I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, and I used to play soccer, so I really looked up to them. So I think the very first person I would invite is Abby Wambach. She was the captain for the U.S. women's team. Um, she retired, I can't remember what year it was, but she, oh, she's like the embodiment of female power. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I, would, I would invite her, even though I probably wouldn't know what to say because I'd freeze up <laughs> after seeing her. Um, okay, two more people. Well, let's stay with her, Abby. Yeah. What would you want to know about? That's hard. I want to know everything. Um, maybe how how being the face of like she was she is. I'm not gonna say what she is. <laughs> she is like this name in the female athletic world. That she's one of the driving and pioneers for like bringing the sport to its popularity where it is now. So I, I'm wondering, like, how was that for her? Like that, I feel like that must have been like a lot to carry. And all, all she did to help build the U.S. women's team to what they are now. I, I'm, I'm really curious. I'm like, what was that like for her? Because mm -hmm. that, that seems like a huge weight to carry. Wow. Yeah, I think that's like one of the, I'm, I'm really curious about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that wow, yeah. Yep. I mean, she came top of mind, and I could see that as you talked about her, how much you admired her and how much I'd say superhero she was for you. Oh yeah. And yeah. still is. Oh yeah. She's retired, but I watch I follow her on social media. I'm like, what are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so Abby would be your first guest. We have two more to invite to your show. Let me think. Hmm. What are some celebrities or famous people that I... I'm drawing a blank. Let me see. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I'm drawing a blank. Well, we can come back if you'd like. We can come back to it. Yeah, I want to take some time to think about it. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. It clicked. It clicked. They came back to me. So can it, is it one single person? Or can it be like a group, a collective group? Because they're together. You're, it's your show. So I think you could invite whomever you want. Okay, so I would invite um a band they're a musical artist a band called pierce the veil there it's four members pierce um, the veil like yeah. pierce the veil okay and the reason why i would invite them is their music has impacted a lot of a lot of people because they have like such powerful messages of like self love and you know mm -hmm. taking care of yourself and they talk about some some topics that are hard to talk about in general, but I feel like it definitely has normalized it. And a lot of people feel heard from listening to their music. So um, I would ask them, like, what, what inspires them to keep music going? Because I think they've been doing it for like 20 years and they're still going strong. 
Um, so <laughs> what keeps that drive in them and how they get inspired to write their music? I feel like um, they released an album around 10 years ago um, that I would say it's one of their best albums, um, <laughs> personally. But even the songs from that album mean so much to people today. And some people are like the, the younger generation are discovering that album now and they're like, mm -hmm. wow, like that I feel heard. So I want to know like what what is that like? Like what's that process of putting their thoughts into a song, like what their creative process is like? I think that'd be cool to figure out. Absolutely. I mean, just as you described, their music resonates with you on a deep level. They're my favorite. Other than the Backstreet Boys, they're definitely my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we heard about the Back Backstreet Boys, and I was wondering if that's who you were re referring to, and it wasn't. You surprised me. No, I don't know if I'd meet the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> it's okay. It's your show, Irene. And then the last, oh my. Yep, one more guest. One more guest. One more. You know, I'm going to go back to the U.S. women's team because I really do look up to all of them. Um, I would uh invite Megan Rapino. Okay. She is one of the current captains. This is her lot like after the world the World Cup is happening right now actually. Ooh. So after it ends she's retiring. She's she's done. And so but she is also one of the current like figures for making a change in the field for women athletics. Um mm -hmm. She's been part of the team. They were advocating for equal pay. So she's been a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, she's made a lot of statements and uh, I would call them poses because during the last book, she did many poses that have become viral and she's advocating for different inequalities and things like that. So I think I would ask her again, like, what is it like right now having all that? Like when people look at you, you're known for standing up for yourself, speaking out. And she has received a lot of hate and a lot of backlash because of it. So the fact that she came back for another World Cup, how does that reflect like in her play? Like when she's on the field, there are a lot of fans, but there are also millions of people watching like from their home. So what is that like? Because I can't imagine again, like the, the weight on her shoulders of not only carrying the team and being one of these big figures, but also knowing that there are a lot of people that don't like you. Mm -hmm. Such a, like a big stage. So I'd be curious about that. So to hear her perspective. Yeah. And then to learn more about, and if you said this a couple of times, the weight on their shoulders. And so um, you're thinking about that you're thinking of the pressures that they might be under and you'd like to know more about what that feels like yeah and then as a funny joke like a funny question I'd ask what how does she choose the next she colors her hair a lot right now with blue. <laughs> how does she choose her next color because I'm like how do you how do you commit to a color like that I'm like well, you just randomly choose I'm, I'm curious <laughs> yeah absolutely I need to know on on your hair you know how do you go about doing that? Right. Thank you, Irene. Mm -hmm. We have three more questions. Okay. What is something unique or quirky about yourself? Hmm. I think that's a hard question. I have to think about that. Hmm. I don't, I wouldn't say maybe unique, but I think it is a little quirky. Um, when I get a little excited, um, sometimes I might make do a little <laughs> like I just <laughs> add it because it's like all the excitement. I'm trying to contain myself, but in the inside, I'm like popping off of excitement or happiness or something like that so like sometimes it does co come out like hee -hee, um <laughs> when I'm talking to someone or I might just like bounce up and down a little bit when I'm really excited about something and I don't realize it <laughs> it just okay. just comes out but also 
it depends on the conversation and the environment. But sometimes I may be speaking in English and I just go into Spanish without realizing it. And there, there's scenarios that where Spanish is not needed. <laughs> and so um, it happens a lot more recently because I, I do speak both, like in my personal life, I speak both languages, just I go back and forth without having to think which one I'm speaking. And when I'm doing therapy with the kids, if I'm only doing it in Spanish, sometimes they want to learn English words. So I, I incorporate some English there and some teaching and then vice versa. Sometimes I'm doing therapy in English and the child says a word in Spanish and asking me what that means in English. I'm like, I have no idea. You know, <laughs> that's a good, I, that's a good question. So sometimes I mix the languages or when I'm talking, both come out or maybe none of them come out. And I, mm-hmm. I honestly don't realize it sometimes. And it's funny when people are like, I mean, <laughs> you just said something in Spanish. I have no idea what you were saying. I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it doesn't happen, but when it happens, it happens. I'm like, oh, I don't realize it. I would imagine that's a surprise when they do point it out to you. Think, oh my goodness. I'm like, oh, did I do that? I'm like, I'm, I'm so sorry. It just was coming out. You know, but the way you describe it, it's like the, the wires get crossed. From yes. Spanish to English and English to Spanish, they might be touching or, or crossing in that way. Um, and I say, what a true gift to be bilingual, Irene. Yeah, I it's absolutely. It's, it's I definitely not to say it wasn't useful because it's always been useful for me because I, I I communicate with my family with both, but I think more in the field looking at it the kids and the families appreciate it so much when I can speak to them in Spanish that I'm really thankful that I can do that for them. And I can, I can make them feel a little bit more validated and heard when they might not have the words to say what they want to say in English. I'm like, it's okay. You can say it in Spanish. I, I understand what you're saying. We can, we can talk in Spanish. It's okay. So I, I'm really thankful that I'm able to do that. I'm thankful too. And even for the parents, sometimes when the parents speak a different language and they only speak that one language. So in the case we're talking about Spanish, you can communicate with them without needing an interpreter or, you know, their children do their best, but you never know if they're getting the right message. So yeah. it's, it's a gift that you're able to do that and a true service. With for your clients and their families. Yeah. Thank you. And so now I'm waiting for that day to hear that little um, squeal that you described too. <laughs> I haven't heard it, but I look forward to the day that I hear that little squeal. <laughs> came out a lot during residency and then people were like, oh, you, you heard that he? I'm like, oh, <laughs> so others heard it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. What is your biggest pet peeve? Oh, I think most recently, my biggest pet peeve is being late or not. Yeah, being late. Um, Not having like a set time that if I'm supposed to meet with someone, they're saying, okay, let's meet at two o'clock. At 201, I'm like, where are you? <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? You're late. Um, I don't know why that's become my biggest pet peeve. Maybe, maybe it might have to do with my son because I'm like, he's gonna wake up any minute. Like, I, I need I need to get this done when I have a shot. Um, maybe that's why it's become a pet peeve of mine. And also because of my son, I I normally like being on time. I like to be if I can be there a little early just to make sure but I realize it's a little harder to get out the house and go out because there's so much to take into account so I've been leaving extra early and I give myself a lot of time to not be late because I'm like I don't want to be that that mom that they're like oh they're late because of the baby so <laughs> you so don't want to be that person 
Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm not going to be late. I'm going to be on time. I'm going to show you wrong. I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I don't, as of late, it's, that's been my pet peeve. You're a minute late. Why? (laughs) I heard you describe that there's more planning for you in preparation to get out of your house because of your baby. And so that's in the front of your mind right now. So you personally won't be late. And so um, that connection to me sounds like because you're doing that and it is doable, uh, that it would be nice if others did the same for you and gave you that same respect to show up on time. Yeah, I'm like, hey, if I could do it, we can all, we can all try. Or I think the thing is when you're late and you just don't let me know, I don't, if you let me know, we're all good. I understand. Cause if I'm late, I'll be like, I'm so sorry. I'm running five minutes behind. Great. We're fine. But I, you know what? It's being late and not being like, there's no communication about I'm like, did you forget? Yes. You just want to know. I just want to know. Be like, are you okay? Because we're supposed to meet. It's been 10 minutes. Are you okay? Like, I, yeah. Yeah. Even when you said that, Irene, if they were like, are you okay? That again speaks to that caring nature that I saw so often um, this last week when working with you and what you're describing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Final question. You ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. How do you advocate for your students and or clients? I love this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is such a need for advocating for our clients, no matter no matter if you're it's in therapy or if it you're just passing by or a general population. There's so much advocacy needed right now. Um, the way I do it with my clients specifically, since I am school based. If a parent is asking for help with, let's say, food, um, there's a shortage of food in the house, or if there's uh, a need for medical insurance, I seek out resources. And or if there's none, I start calling people. I'm like, what do you what do you know about this? Is there a food bank that's nearby that's running? Uh, is the medical insurance accepting new applicants right now? So in that sense. It's really intertwined. I found to be intertwined in what we do in our field because if, for example, the food, let's look at the food. If there is no food in the house and or a lack of food, then the client and the student are hungry. And then that affects their mental health too. So advocating in that sense, um, I do it almost every day. Um, and an example I'm thinking of as well is when the pandemic hit, um, everyone moved virtual and this was the first time for a lot of parents that they were using laptops or using zoom and things like that and so something I found I was being told the students are missing class they're not logging in they're not logging in and when I would talk to the parent they didn't know how so it's not the student's fault and it's not the parent's fault either um, it was a big learning curve for everyone. And so what I would do, I would take I would take some time and I would teach them like how to log into the computer. Because again, thinking about like the population I work with, the parents didn't speak English and some of my parents couldn't read. And so the laptop was programmed in English. Yes, on top absolutely. Of, on top of the fact that they couldn't read. So we would have to use symbols and a, like use letters to identify where they would click to the point where they learned how to use the basic functions of a laptop. And then also thinking about that, a lot of my families didn't have Wi-Fi. So how are the students supposed to log in if they don't have Wi-Fi to connect their laptops to log into class? So it was a lot of advocating on a community level for these families um, and working with um my colleagues to try to find access to these needs because it's it wasn't the child's fault and it wasn't the parent's fault to say it wasn't really anyone's fault because we didn't see it the pandemic coming but you know advocating on their behalf to let the school know it's not that they don't want to it's that they don't know how so how 
can we overcome that barrier so that the kids can get what they need and the parents feel less frustrated mm-hmm. um those are kind of some of the ways that I'm thinking about how I advocate. And academically, if a student needs a behavioral plan or an IEP or um, extra assistance, or even if it's just something like breaks during the school during the school day, I I work very actively with the student to talk with their teachers, being like, "This is what we have in mind. If he feels he's going to attend." He's going to ask for a break and we're like, call me and we're going to walk around the building. So advocating for the needs of the kids during the school day, since I am there all day um, during the school day, if there's anything that would help the student that is doable, I definitely advocate for them to have that resource or that additional support. Because again, if they don't, if they feel like they're not being heard, which can happen in schools, um, staff are overwhelmed so it can be hard to keep track of everything but if I can be that extra voice for the student to get what they need so they can they can be successful during the school day I will definitely do that I'm annoying (laughs) in the nice way (laughs) to make sure my kids get what they need yep you will you will advocate for them I mean hearing you describe if their basic needs aren't being met I mean, that's, that's a challenge to show up every day and to be present even for their academics. So hearing you look for those resources to provide to those families that need them, truly you're looking at the, I think the whole child and their families to ensure yeah. that they're gonna be successful in school and personally, that's yeah. what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah one of those pieces are missing it affects everything so if I can do something to support the family or get what that child needs I will definitely do my best to try Mm, yeah you're looking for those gaps and you're filling them and you said persistently (laughs) you will be definitely be persistent wow Well, Irene, thank you so much for sharing more of who you are with us today, listening to how you advocate for your students in the schools. Personally, um, I'm grateful that you are giving to our children in that way. Um, It's clear to me you're where you need to be. And um, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to have gotten to know you better and for others to hear what you are doing in the community. Um, Anyway, great interview. I wish you only the best. And I suspect that you're gonna continue to be successful in all that you do as you go forward. (laughs) All right, so this concludes our interview for today and I wish you well, take care.